What's up and welcome back to the Kind of Funny Games cast. As always, I'm Tim Geddes, joined by one of the coolest dudes in video games, Greg Miller. How you doing, Tim? I'm doing really good. Uh, congratulations is in order. Greg Miller, a voice in the new upcoming Ghostbusters game called Ghostbusters... Spirits Unleashed. Ghostbusters Spirits Unleashed. I won't lie. This is, this is the first time I like. I think I've known about a game I'm in this far in, uh, in advance. So like, I learned the name yesterday, and it has been hard to make it stick. <laughs> I won't mm-hmm. say multiple times today. I've been writing tweets and like fucking open up the the FAQ. Like, what is this thing called? After just being what, Ghostbusters forever. Yeah, Ghostbusters. What, what do you Spirits What do you have to say stick. about this? I know you talked about a lot of shows, but what's the what's the quick pitch here, Greg? Quick pitch is, uh, yeah, if you didn't know, uh, Ilphonic, the folks behind Friday Thirteenth and Predator Hunting Grounds, are making a Ghostbusters game. It's 4v1. Uh, I, I've i played it. I'm in it, so you can take my opinion with a grain of salt, but I'm a big Ghostbusters fan who often says I don't like Ghostbusters stuff. So you figure out what you want to do with it. Uh, really enjoyed the demos I have played of this game. I think it looks really cool. I think it is also Ilphonic owning what they have uh, made mistakes about in the past before, where they, are, they know they can't miss with this one. They are aiming for the, you know, uh, to shake this thing of being the buggy developer uh they are very intent on making their servers and getting you into matchmaking way quicker and more important most importantly i think is that you can play it offline you don't need to play it online they are not this is a 4v1 game but you can play all with ai bots if you want and there is a story mode to it and i think that's the interesting thing about it right as you level up your characters and your ghost in the game because you obviously are playing as a ghost or the ghostbusters uh you are unlocking story beats that are pulling you through a narrative so you could just play it all offline if you want to uh but for me who's already he had his dreams come true with Ghostbusters, the video game happening and being able to play uh, a, a tale where I was in a Ghostbusters movie, the third Ghostbusters movie at the time. Uh, it's another dream come true for me to drag all you clowns out there and like, you know, go out there and customize my proton pack and my suit and everything else. I'm going to I am going to I'm going to go pro in this game. You know what I mean? We joke around a lot about trying to be as good as Nitro Rifle Andy Cortez. I will be the expert at this game. Speaking of, we do have the Nitro Rifle, Andy Cortez, joining us. Do you think that you're going to go pro as well, Andy? I mean, it doesn't take much to catch up to Greg in skill level. So, like, we saw what happened when he had Mario Golf for at least two and a half years before it came out on Nintendo Switch. And then I hopped in day two, immediately dominated him. So I have no problem with... uh, Here's what I want, Andy. All right, here's what I want. Because, you know, jokes aside, you and I love each other in a very, very weird fashion just like it's just creepy a lot of people say it's weird uh when mostly this from one on- side from one side mostly like it's rarely from my end yeah no nah, nah, don't worry about okay. it you know what i mean okay. uh but like i think we should what i want us to do is like get really good at the game and just go out there and clown people out because it'll just be us as the four ghostbusters you me blessing maybe i'm not gonna make them commit maybe we get nick in there for the comedic relief you know what i mean and then we go out there and we just destroy kids that's trying to be ghosts well we had a the blast new- doing that in predator like right we- and that's what i'm saying yeah we the amount of times that like we played Predator just at night for fun was like yeah. it was it was a lot it was a blast so yeah I'm definitely I'm looking forward whenever you all are into a video game I get excited because it's like I get a chance to just go fool around with you dudes and and have fun full crossplay there you go I know crossplay is something that excites the new face of video games blessing at Aoya Junior. What's up, Tim? Tim, you look great, by the way. I don't know if I have if, I, if I've had the chance to tell you this on you content, did. but you I look think wonderful. like three times you've told me, and I, every okay, time it just gets enough. better and better. It's I'm gonna keep telling you. I'm telling you. you, you it, 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 thank you. I really, really appreciate that. And it took three minutes and forty nine seconds for us to finally introduce this man, but it's been even longer. I can't believe we've never had you on anything before the show. We were talking about that. It blows my mind. It's such a small and big industry at the same time. The one and only from IGN.com, Tom Marks. Hello. Woo! Oh, please, please. It, I gotta say, it was really nice just like soaking in all the love there because it was, it, it's just it's just, just a, a fun, warm feeling on this show. So many, like, you guys like each other so genuinely. I love it. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what they say. Let us know in the comments below how much love we have for each other, how much hate <laughs> we have. I don't know. I've heard it both ways. Cause hey, this, I, can, it, I can feel it, okay? <laughs> good, good, good. Comments. That's what matters. That's what matters. Uh, of course, this is the kind of funny games cast where each and every week we get together to talk about video games and all the things that we love about them. You can get it on YouTube.com slash kind of funny games or roosterteeth.com. You can also get it as a podcast by searching your favorite podcast service for kind of funny games cast and we'll be right there for you. If you wanted to get the show ad free, if you wanted to watch live as it's being recorded and and if you want the exclusive post show, you got to go to patreon.com slash kind of funny games, just like our Patreon producers, Gordon McGuire, Fargo Brady, Pranksy, 
Dan, Golden Spider, B, Tyler Ross, Delaney Twinning, First Responder, and D, Julian the Gluten-Free Gamer, James Hastings, and Casey Andrew have all done. Thank you all so very, very much. But if you don't have a buck to toss our way, when you're out there buying video games on the Epic Game Store, use our creator code, Kind of Funny, and... That will help get us money without costing you anything else extra. And they're doing a really cool thing right now where all the money made in Fortnite right now is going for the next two weeks is going straight to uh, relief efforts over in Ukraine. So that is awesome. Please go help them. And then it helps us. It's just helping everybody. So it's just great. Good guys. Epic over there. Um, But enough of that stuff. I want to get to the housekeeping here. Of course, we have Tom Marks here to talk about Kirby. I'm very excited about that. But we've had a lot of other games cast love going on recently. We had the Ghostwire Tokyo review that went up a couple days ago. You can check that out right now on all the places I just mentioned. And then also, if you want an even deeper dive into the Ghostbusters game that we just talked about a little bit, uh, Greg talked a lot about it on PS. I love you. Isn't that right? That's right. It's a, a little episode featuring me blessing that then escalates into you, Barrett, Paris, and Lucy James. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. you never know what will happen on PS I Love You XOXO. Exactly. Uh, but without further ado, let's get right into it. Kirby and the Forgotten Lands. I want to just start off by saying major shout out to Nintendo for the amazing embargo that they had like we've had this game for like two and a half weeks and i feel like in recent times that's been the opposite story for a lot of developers where they're just like throwing games they're like good luck (laughs) the the embargoes in a day and a half and i'm like thank you nintendo thank you very much but tom you reviewed the game for ign i want to know what your thoughts are but also i want to know what score you would give what score you're giving it at IGN, but also what score you'd give it on the kind of funny scale, which is one to five, one being terrible, two being bad, three being okay, four being great, and five being amazing. Uh, I think probably pretty similar between them, uh, probably a four on your scale, because I'm giving it an eight on mine. I think it's great. I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, it, it is, it's it's just really good Kirby, <laughs> you know, like Kirby often kind of diverges into gimmicks sometimes, which can be hit and miss and this is the you know it goes to 3d but man it's just really fun and it's really well designed levels and yeah i think it's a really really great kirby game yeah i am absolutely blown away to say that i am giving kirby a five out of five saying that it is amazing and and i do want to say like just to get ahead of it it is definitely a low five for me but i was debating the entire time am i giving it a four am i giving it a five and i i think that uh to use the ign scale this would probably be a nine uh, on, on, on my scale there. So that makes it the five out of five for us. I do think that this is an amazing game. I think the, the more I played it and what I think crossing like the halfway mark is where it really solidified for me, where I'm like, yeah, I'm going five for this. This is something truly special. Um, I've never loved a Kirby game. I, enjoyed ones here and there obviously superstar is a classic um but i never thought that it was a classic in the same way we talk about a lot of other super nintendo games like mario world or or link to the past or super castlevania or any of that and then as it went on getting to things like kirby's epic yarn like tom you were talking about the kind of more gimmicky things that that kirby does to kind of stay relevant um a little fun here and there, but I feel like the overall package has never really spoken to me as anything more than just okay, um, especially when you start comparing it to other platformers and, and things like Mario um, or even like other mascot platformers like Crash Bandicoot or, um, you know, like the other things that are more similar. Ukulele. Yeah, exactly. Um, or things that are similar to this style of game like uh, Sackboy's Big Adventure uh, that came out a couple years ago um, at the launch of the PS4. Five. PS5. Um, but I think that with that, this is the first time, this being the first time Kirby's been in a full 3D adventure, I really think that this stands closer to the the Marios of the world than any Kirby game we've ever had previously. And I, I think that that's kind of the the biggest starting point for me that I, I've been so so wowed at that those eyes. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's going on, Kirby? <laughs> that uh I don't want to get it twisted. Like, you know, one of my biggest kind of criticisms of prior Kirby games is that the the challenge just isn't there. The difficulty is just non-existent in any way, shape, or form. And I don't think that this game um 
is as difficult as some of the more challenging things in uh, some of the later levels of 3D or 2D Mario games. But I do think that the challenge is always fun and it's never too easy. Like you're, it's yeah. everything that they have you doing kind of feels um, like it has a purpose and is enjoyable to to get through. And there's more than a handful of things that I had to try. 10 times before I completed. And I thought that that was a, a really cool thing. But what, what do you think about that? No, yeah, I, I think that's a, a definitely a good point. Like Kirby, to give my background, Kirby is my favorite Nintendo character, like just straight up. I, I mean, I love Zelda and I love the Mario games and all that. I'm not like hating on the others, but I love Kirby games. I always play the Kirby games. And uh, this recently, there's been kind of a tendency to lump Kirby into the same sort of wheelhouse is the yoshi games as like oh those are just their easy games for kids right mm -hmm. like which is not like you know that's a fine thing to make nintendo is for all ages or whatever and they appeal to a lot of different audiences but this game i was worried was gonna be like i think the last last one was woolly world no crafted world yoshi's crafted world was the last one yes which was really fun but also had some levels in that game where you could literally just hold right on the stick and press jump occasionally and do nothing else and get to the end of a level and like that was mindless difficulty right whereas this game is again like you said not like super hard but it has moments where it does push you and it does make you move around and like think about how you're using your powers think about how you're fighting those bosses right or or think about some of the challenges especially like the challenge levels that they have that are off to the side that are optional that are really really satisfying and i love that this game can offer both sides of that blessing uh yeah like i i when you talk about this game right tim i feel like we're pretty similar nintendo fans in terms of like our history with kirby and and how we look at platformers and all these things right where uh what was it i guess a year ago was it two years ago when a uh, uh, super mario 3d world plus bowser's fury came out uh last year, last year. i remember playing through that and being like okay, this is what I love, right? This is what I want out of a 3D platform or out, out of a platform in general, which is like the diverse levels, the different like mechanics, the, 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 the like that Nintendo level of game design where it is, hey, let's get, let's introduce an idea. Let's take this idea to, to, to the end of it and let's introduce something else and let's keep that flow going. I feel like there's such a strong level of, you know, uh, variation in how you play. And specifically when you talk about level design in Super Mario 3D World that I really loved. One of the things that stuck out to me when they announced Kirby and the Forgotten Land was how different it looked just setting wise. Cause like, you know, there are the memes of, oh, this looks like the last of us, but Kirby, or this looks like Nier Automata, right? Or like an entirely different game. It looks like post-apocalyptic Kirby. Is it, cause use the, the uh, Sackboy Big Adventure um, comparison, right? Is it still level based in terms of each world kind of has its own different gimmick to it? Like, am I finding water worlds? Am I finding uh, uh, snow worlds? Is it like that? Or does it fall into that forgotten lands? Like, no, everything is dilapidated jungle type thing. It's, uh, it's a little mix of what you're actually saying there. So yeah. there are distinct worlds in terms of visuals, but the gimmicks aren't uh, – tied necessarily to those worlds alone like the the gimmicks you're talking about in this game is called mouthful mode which is yes it's already funny as is and in the game it's funny like kirby kind of takes on uh like sucks in a car in his mouth and all of a sudden you control a car um or uh <laughs> like random things like a, a safety cone um or uh, a wall or a vending machine like it's really bizarre shit that lets you kind of like traverse the environment in different ways uh but what's cool about it is it is not in place of the traditional kirby copy abilities that you're you're getting from the enemies you can um suck in an enemy to get the sword power up and then as you can see there actually barrett if you could scroll back just a little bit when he's the the stairs um you can see he he has the the hat on still um so he has a power up and then is he able to architecture like yeah no it's it's wild and I mario think that and odyssey can throw his cap and suddenly do you know he takes on these awesome powers and kirby is just you know and, and now i am a footstool <laughs> yeah, no it's and i think that that is kind of the the coolest thing about this and like i i'm gonna say a statement that i feel like throughout this conversation will break down in different ways but this game has a lot of elements that i love from other nintendo games where it very much has the kind of um gameplay level design of mario 3d world in in terms of what bless was talking about of 
there's intricate platforming, but then there's also kind of the introdu- introducing a concept of a, a, a gameplay gimmick and then leveling up that gimmick throughout the world that you're playing till by the end of it, you're like, oh, wow, I'm using this in really creative ways compared to when it was first introduced that I really enjoy. But then it's kind of mixed with the absolutely grandiose, insane epicness of the Mario Galaxy series, especially when it comes to the music and the way the whole thing's presented, mixed with the the kind of ability capturing that Kirby's always had, but it feels more similar to uh, Mario Odyssey in this to me, of like the abilities are really kind of being used in very cool, unique ways to uh, combat enemies, but also to traverse the levels. And it results in like some combat uh, encounters that are, way more Dash and Perry, Andy Cortez style than I would have ever expected from a Kirby game. Like, it's never quite a platinum game, but, like, it feels way more like that than I think it has any right to, but it works. And all that combines together to being this extremely weird game that is its own thing. Like, I'm comparing it to all these other things, but it is all of those things in this in this giant pink wrapper, mouthful mode, um, that kind of results in something that I think is so special because Bless talking about the, the Last of Us aesthetic of it all, that is pervasive across the entire game. Like no matter what the world or level is, everything has this kind of weird abandoned 90s feel. Everything is extremely colorful, but like off just a little bit. And it kind of makes it weird. But the game starts off with you being like marooned on this beach and then you like walk through a jungle and almost immediately you're in this like apocalyptic looking world. And I'm like, we straight up went from Naughty Dog's Crash Bandicoot to Naughty Dog's Last of Us in like two minutes (laughs) in a Kirby game. What the hell are we about to do? And the title screen hits and it is one of the funniest moments I've had. (laughs) And like funny because I'm laughing at it, but like they know I'm laughing at it. And it's just this weird going through the fourth wall that they just commit to through the entire game. Tom, do you think that I'm I'm hitting the mark with that? No, you're you're dead on because I I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Like I wasn't sold by the mouthful mode thing at first. Like I thought Kirby or whatever people were calling it was funny, but I didn't think it was like I was like this is really weird for Kirby. A- and then there's a moment in that opening title scene that that you were talking about where it like gives you the title card where. <laughs> Kirby's driving and he kind of like lifts his bumper and waves his little mirror arms like because he's just like having a good time driving and I was like oh Nintendo knows what they're doing here right like they 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 lean into the absurdity of it enough that it just it it just becomes really fun and it just becomes really like playful with itself I will say I did get a little bit like not tired of because it's a pretty game but like it was kind of funny that like every because there are different themed worlds like every world eventually ends up on like a rusted rooftop at one point or another right which was like a little bit disappointing but the worlds are so pretty and so varied kind of thematically that i didn't really mind that all as much you know it it does a really good job i think you're right of just like you said committing right if it if it had just done a little bit it would have been maybe in an awkward spot but since it really just does lean into it it's it's really wonderful and going back to the kind of uh, way the game is set up, so Bless was kind of asking about the level-to-level uh, gameplay. Like, the way that it works is every world, which there's about six of them, has, like, uh, a handful of levels, like five or six levels each, one being a boss level, and then the rest of them just kind of being more traditional platforming levels. After every single platforming level, you unlock two challenge levels like Tom was talking about. And those levels are totally based on specific abilities. So you'll unlock two cha- two challenge levels per level beat. One will be for the bomb ability, one for the sword ability. And as you do these challenges, they each take between like two and five minutes. Uh, if you complete them, you get this certain type of currency that can you, you can use to upgrade uh, abilities later. Uh, but there's also a like target time to beat that's kind of like the more hard mode uh, that you can get into. And that to me, is like where it really got extra fun where i'm like okay i i want to get that that beat the target time and that resulted in me kind of going back and like i was saying there were some things that took me like 10 times to to be able to accomplish and that was satisfying and something i really didn't expect from a kirby game at all these levels reminded me more so of the mario sunshine levels without flood and I was shocked that they kind of make up half the game at the end of the day when you look at what Kirby and the Forgotten Land offers. Yeah. Um, and I was just really impressed by the gameplay challenges that they presented. 
Yeah, and, and you made the comparison to Sackboy, right? Sackboy had similar sort of challenge levels, right, where they're these little timed things, and they're a great way to sort of just opt into as much difficulty as you want because there were definitely love and but i like how like varied they are like some of them like the sword one might be a combat arena where you're fighting a bunch of guys as quickly as you can whereas the one for the cutter might be using the cutter all all around like this mechanic of the cutter coming back to you so you like throw it out and then reposition yourself so it'll hit buttons on the way back so it's doing things both that you are doing in levels but kind of amped up and then also doing things that wouldn't be doing in normal levels in, in a contained way. So they're they're really creative. Andy Cortez. Uh, I don't, like, when I look at Kirby, I don't know much about this man. Like, I, <laughs> I think I know Kirby from Smash Bros. And I never really played any of the other Kirby games. Obviously, I, we know the gimmicks, and t- Smash has kind of taught me mostly, uh, most what I know about the guy. Um, were there any mechanics that you were really excited to get your hands on and then you found that they kind of like were, you know, less exciting once you started using them and then vice versa. Were there any ones where you're like, oh, this is probably going to be shitty and you're like, oh, wow, good job, Nintendo. You did it. Kind of like all of the mouthful modes for that second one, to be honest. Like, I was I was really sh- thought that, you know, the mouthful mode for like a giant pipe, like how are <laughs> they going to make that fun, right? And they managed to keep reusing it in different ways, in creative ways that I think that was really impressive to me. Um, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say for me, it was it was more kind of like I I didn't expect to enjoy upgrading all the abilities as much as I did. I, I thought mm-hmm. that it was going to be more like, OK, I like the sword. I like the this or that. And I don't really care about all these other ones. So. I don't care about upgrading them at all, but I found it ended up being a lot more like a Ratchet and Clank game Mm -hmm. uh, in the way that I was like, even if I don't like this weapon, it is fun enough to use that I want to play through it to upgrade it all the way because it's satisfying. And like they kind of create really cool challenges, uh, especially with these challenge modes um, that kind of like grow with you. And like Tom was saying, like maybe the core game, like these like, uh, platforming levels don't really take advantage of them too much, but these challenge levels absolutely do. And what's really cool is I, I really like how the economy works in this game. So there's a lot of collectibles and all the collectibles kind of feel like they're feeding into each other in ways that is very, very motivating. And, and actually, I want to go back to something that Andy brought up um, that I think really will contextualize this to a lot of people that have listen to me talk about video games for a long time. Uh, this game's made by HAL Laboratories. HAL Laboratories is the same company that originally created Super Smash Brothers on the N64. Uh, Sakurai, the director of Smash Brothers we always talk about, is the creator of Kirby. So a lot of Kirby games and gameplay elements or a lot of Smash Brothers elements are legitimately just ripped straight out of Kirby and not just the characters and weapons, but the way the characters move and feel and just like the overall vibe of the game and especially collecting collectathons and all that stuff. And you guys know me. I love my spirits. I love all that stuff. This game delivers that tenfold. Like it legitimately has like trophies from Smash Melee. They're in this game. Like it's the exact kind of same same thing and um it's it's fun to kind of like go out and collect them all those might be my least favorite of the collectibles in this game but there's there's those and the main thing is there's these waddle d's so the little kirby homies that you know the little like they're like light red um they're out there and they all get captured or some shit who really cares it doesn't matter uh but every level you just kind of are trying to get to the end and uh then you win and you you rescue like three of these guys at the end throughout the level Tim, I'm sure they wouldn't be happy about you minimizing their trauma. Like, you're exactly. like that, is, that is true. They're that captured, is true. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they would appreciate me because I'm I'm going out there. And I'm trying to save each and every single Good job. one. I'm proud of you. OK, uh, yeah. but like you, you, you could beat the level and that's it. Or like traditional Nintendo platformer games. There's the challenges, right? Like we played Mario 3D World last year, Andy, and we wanted to get all the green stars, right? And get all mm-hmm. the the extra stuff. Don't get the Tadouki, all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, this every single level has these like optional challenges to rescue more waddle d's in the level some of them are very very simple like beat that beat the mini boss without getting hit some of them are more like obscure and you kind of got to think a little bit none of them are too crazy but it's like um find the the hidden tower 
So you're always kind of exploring the level and trying to find where is there a tower? Oh, there's one. I should probably try to like find a way to, to get over there. And it's, it's satisfying enough. And I feel like that's where like the kind of challenge that I was really like, huh, this game has more to offer than I would have ever expected. You get these Waddle Dees, and as you collect them, they get sent back to Waddle Dee Town, and they're building out the town. And uh, the more you get, the quicker they make some flavor town. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, they start to kind of populate this this town we're seeing. Um, God, this B roll is incredible for what I'm saying. Thank you, Barrett. <laughs> but um, there's like different things where you, there's like this little restaurant um, that that can kind of heal you uh, when you buy the the items and stuff. These are the the trophies I was talking about. Um, and then there's also the weapon shop where you upgrade all of your your different abilities and each one has a couple levels of upgrading to go and every time you do that eventually in the main game you're unlocking even more challenge levels so there's sword challenge level one but then there's also sword challenge level two and then sword challenge level you know etc etc and that kind of loop of constantly like all right i'm going to play through the main level to unlock as many waddle d's so that they're building something in the town but to uh, buy stuff in the town you need these special stars you get the special stars by doing the challenge levels i just think they did a really good job it's not revolutionary but i think it's a they did a really good job of making sure that the economy of it all made sense that everything you're doing is a step that you want to be doing to get the I was next gonna thing. Say, so it's all adding on to you wanting to continue to play and wanting to continue to do everything Yes. And so where I'm at now is I, I beat the game and I'm trying to hundred percent it. Like I'm trying to go back and, and get everything and I'm having a great time doing that. I think currently I'm at like 90% done of everything. And it's it, it, with rare exception, I've had fun the entire time. There's uh, a bunch of mini games on top of it as Waddle D town starts to build up. Like the, uh, we even saw it a little bit there. Like once you get the restaurant going and you can like buy the um, food, there's also a restaurant mini game where you can, take up a part-time job and be a little chef, you know, um, or there's a fishing mini game or there, there's a bunch of mini games. And most of the mini games are reminiscent of old Kirby games. So there's one that is straight up just the tilt and tumble uh, from the OG, like handheld Kirby games and stuff. And those are some of the only challenges that I have not yet completed on. It's most challenging because it is very hard, but Tom, what do you think about those? Yeah, the the mini games are are fun. And I like that. They bring that, that legacy back from old Kirby games. It, also, uh, Andy, you saying you hadn't played much, you only knew Kirby from Smash. The funny thing is, it did you ever play Subspace Emissary, the campaign for I think it was Super Smash Bros. Brawl? I was on Wii, right? I mm-hmm. think so. I think that's um, where that one was. I, I like it's something that I think my friends and I were like, oh, let's try this. No, let's go back to multiplayer mode. Like that's fair. Ker- Kirby for me was <laughs> always the platformer because I even like I had the old school Game Boy one, like on, on the fat Game Boy. And I remember thinking even at the time, like, is Kirby just a thing that exists so that we aren't oversaturated with Mario games? <laughs> like, because I didn't find a whole lot of difference in what Kirby was. And now also sure. I was like, you know, five years old at the time. But uh, yeah, I just don't I never really forever for whatever reason, I was never pulled to new Kirby games, you know? Yeah. And Kirby for me has always been like, it's less about the platforming and it's slightly more about the combat and a lot more about the variety. I think that's why, you know, Kirby Superstar for Super Nintendo or whatever is such an iconic game because it's not one game. It's like eight or whatever. And and it's all crammed into this one thing and they all have a little bit of a different flavor to them. And the, the reason I brought up Subspace Emissary, although this is a little bit of a tangent, is like Sakurai created kirby and he literally just backdoor made a kirby game in smash bros because that's what that is that campaign of smash bros is just full-on a kirby game where instead of powers you have smash bros characters um and so it's it's cool to see how much that series was as has evolved and it's cool to see this game kind of make a jump that it wasn't making up until now right like super mario made the jump to 3d and the n64 right like a, a lot of other games have already done this and so it was neat to see them try this and i think it has worked really well i mean i think that's something really interesting too which is the me being a lifelong nintendo fan like i remember uh the, uh, the n64 when they first announced uh kirby and the crystal shards i was so so excited because i thought it was going to be the 3D Mario 64ization of Kirby, right. and then it totally wasn't. And then they announced a Kirby on GameCube that was that, and it ended up getting canceled. Like, there's a trailer out there you can find. This is that game. Like, this is it finally fulfilled. And, like, I actually think that it's such a great 
timing for it because I, I do think that it was the Mario 3D World template that works best for Kirby, where I think this is a legitimately, like, amazing game, not in just like, oh, it's the best Kirby game. Like, I think that this is a, a game that Nintendo Switch owners should give a, a real shot. Like, Switch during the Switch era, I think Nintendo's done a good job of kind of either – completely revolutionizing their franchises or kind of just giving them just enough of a fresh coat of paint that they feel more relevant than they ever have. Like things like Luigi's Mansion, right? Like the, Luigi's Mansion 3 being what it was, it, it's like introducing that franchise to so many new people. And I think that this team really took that challenge on. They were like, we need Kirby to mean something more than it's meant in the last decade because there are – millions of switch owners out there that are going to give this one a shot this is going to be kirby's highest selling game of all time like easily like i wouldn't be shocked if it ends up being the highest selling one by double by the end of its run because the highest selling one if i remember correctly is only at like five million right now so i i do think that this has uh, a lot of potential and i think that the word of mouth on it the, the, the mouthful of words on it um hmm. are is going to be very very positive um tim uh, tim and uh tom just based on like time of completion i think that's a really important thing for me with this game because it's something that interests me but i don't want i have probably have like another 300 hours in elden ring left you know what i mean <laughs> so um tim you were mentioning all those extra stuff that you were all the extra things you were doing in this game how much of your enjoyment is kind of dependent on those extra things like do you feel like that significantly enhanced your experience and if not how much how quickly could i beat this game um yes it definitely significantly enhances it i do think that that those are the things that take me from a four to a five um and again it, it's the low five like this is what would take me from an eight to a nine um is all that the extra stuff but the game doesn't present it like it's extra and the coolest thing is uh like we were talking about earlier even these, the challenge levels, they're two minutes long. And uh, you get the reward that you need to get just completing them, and none of them are difficult. Like, so it's just two minutes, you're done. It's the doing it under the best time that's the challenge. And you don't really get anything extra for that besides just kind of feeling good. But like, action. it's clearly like it was designed for you to feel good. So um, I think that it, it they're, they do feel like they're kind of the part of the main game. And I think that doing all the extra challenges like uh, just to get the reward for it would probably combine to an hour extra gameplay total. Okay. Um, but then the, the total gameplay for the game itself, like, I don't know. I want to say it was like six hours or so to beat the game. Oh, sure. um, okay. if, if you wanted to, to just kind of rush through it probably even quicker um because there's not it it's it's linear for all intents and purposes it's more 3d world than mario 64 for sure um but there's 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 post-game content there's a lot of extra stuff like i am probably like 12 hours in so far um and i probably have another like four to go to 100 percent at all how what? much time are you spending in uh, Waddle, Waddle D Town? Because that seems really cool, right? Like, that was the thing I, I saw at the trailer, and I was like, okay, that seems like it's going to be a small part of the game. But the way you talk about it, it sounds like everything's kind of contributing to it as you go and as you do all the extra stuff. Are you then going back and spending a lot of time there, or is it really just like a check-in every now and then? Uh, Tom, I want to hear what you have to say about this, but I, I want to answer first quickly because it, it ties back to Andy's last question, too. Um, I feel like the Waddle D Town section it really picks up in the like latter half of the game when you like start to have just a lot more collectibles by default. I think that it's a really slow go for the beginning and it's not interesting at all. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is really interesting. But it definitely like it took too long to get to the point for it to be cool. Yeah, you you check in pretty regularly because you're constantly you get blueprints that you can then use. You go back to town to buy to spend those stars that he was talking about on uh, upgrading your abilities. So you got to like do that occasionally, but I agree. Like once you've established the buildings and you can go back there and you can check in on lots of little different things, it's not 
it's not like a full town builder, right? Like, it's not like if, uh, oh, I'm totally blanking on that, a JRPG, Nino Kuni. It's not like Nino Kuni, right? Or Nino Kuni 2, where you're like, going to be going back to your town to manage things a lot or whatever. Mm-hmm. It It is it is very much just sort of like a hub that you can like buy an item or play a little mini game here and there or upgrade. An I, I was thinking Dark Cloud, like when, it, for, when you guys first started mm-hmm. talking about it, because no. like I fucking love Dark Cloud, going into the dungeons, finding the parts and then bringing them back and then building yeah. the town and then it's hanging out with the that. people. Okay. I don't know it's, why I'm just I'm immediately reminded of the Chow section in like uh, Sonic Adventure. Sonic Adventure. <laughs> it's definitely uh, more yeah. Chow. <laughs> it is more. Yeah. Do you have Here's any investment thing. in it? I would like uh, now? kind of. I would say it's more Chow mixed with the castle from Mario sixty four. And I think that might that might sound like too high praise, but I think the Chow thing should balance it out a little bit to be realistic. <laughs> like it it's cool because there's there's a at the end of the day probably like. 10 different things to do in the town and the town itself has secrets that you can kind of unlock um and there's like like one of the areas that you the buildings is like a post office and the post office gets like mail and uh you can kind of use these like codes that you find hidden around the town to unlock letters that kirby gets um, and so like you're incentivized to kind of explore the entire town it's not that big of a space like honestly i would say it's probably as big as like comet observatory for mario galaxy okay okay so you're like kind of like going around the whole hub world um but it's i think it's way more interesting than comet observatory yeah. um so not quite mario 64 but but a step up from galaxy it's cool too because there's a lot like one of the things i really like about this game that's real subtle is there's just a ton of tiny little details that are really really nice right like it's got People people talk about that um that kind of ethereal Nintendo polish, right? And it feels like this game has that for sure. And so there are thresholds where it's like once you've got 50 Waddle Dees, this building will get built. Once you've got 60, this building will get built. But also on top of that, just as your population increases, the population of the town actually sort of gets a little more bustling. So once you get the little restaurant, you know, there'll be an empty table out front. But then as you get more Waddle Dees, maybe one waddle dee be sitting there and then you get a few more and then there's like two having lunch together and it's like there's a lot of cute (laughs) little things like that yeah and it's cute things that kind of make you feel nostalgic for things that like i didn't really care about necessarily uh at the beginning but like kirby gets a house uh that's at waddle (laughs) dee town i know exactly (laughs) so you go into this house and the, the house kind of starts to uh populate as you explore and like uh get different things um and there's like a, a storybook that uh appears at some point and you can look at the storybook and it's like reflecting on his old re- adventures mm. and like as you're like it's just kind of like a fun picture That's but cool. it's almost That's as cute. if he's taken pictures throughout his life of all the different things he's done and when you're looking at them there's like a description you could read and like the music strangling from... another thing and you're like whoa what, did that <laughs> from? what the hell is that <laughs> yeah uh it's it's pretty pretty cool stuff and like it's just dumb little things but like i just uh, tom was talking about the nintendo kind of magic and polish and i, I do think that this game has it in a way that like kirby star allies which was the last game released on switch like really just kind of felt like all right we just got to put something out this felt like it's so much more than that like this is a core nintendo game yeah tim you mentioned like you know feeling like you just got had to put something out and i feel like kirby's been that for a while in terms of i i feel like every year there is at least one kirby game that comes out and i'm like really wow another one after playing this one do you feel like we're gonna get more of this or do you think we're gonna get more of this plus all the other kirby shit we usually get like where do you think kirby goes from here I, I think we'll always get the the random spinoffs and and the Kirby Robotabot or whatever it's called. Like there, there's always going to be that stuff, but this game is going to perform. This yeah. game is going to be something we get sequels for, and I am very very excited about that. Yeah. Is there really a Kirby game every year? Like I... they make a lot of spinoffs. Like they okay. made two different Arena Fighter Kirby games that are like mobile. I think they're also on mobile, and you get like got the like timed thing where you can only play so much in a day unless you pay mm. real money like mm. they, so they've done a lot of stuff like that with kirby gotcha. yeah, yeah there's another one coming out i think this year that got announced that i gotta double check because i think it was like a low-key kind of like not free to play but that has those sort of vibes kind of thing but yeah usually they're 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 like it is like yeah here's the arena fighter one here's like another just random 2d one like here's one for 3ds like there's a pretty good rotation of, of kirby yeah, games that last, come out. looking at it last year was the first year since 2013 where kirby did not have a game wow yeah yeah, yeah the arena there, fighter man. one greg was a lot like the what's that what was that built-in 3ds game where you would just take your little dude and go do quests and things of that nature 
on the 3D. Like you would, I would meet another character and the I could AR like take. Game? No, it was the no. one that wasn't Street Pass, right? That's what you're talking about. There was Street it, Pass, and there was the other one where you like went through and had, people had different colored shirts, right? Wasn't yeah. that a big part of it? Yeah, you hit with you the would, thing. Yeah, it was like you were just like a little RPG character, and you would just go through like this. I went the that, dragon. That's the huh. boss, right? Uh, I've been never got that far. It. I'm not pro. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> <laughs> take it easy, too. <laughs> the funny thing about that Kirby Arena Fighter, or at least one of them, because I, th- I think there's two. The one I of them was two. like basically like monster hunter low-key because you would fight bosses and then get specific items from them that you could then use to craft things like it was like very weird they do weird stuff with kirby yeah definitely i think think to your point like there's i agree i think this is gonna do well enough and be well enough received that hopefully they start doing more stuff like this right and and who knows because 3d world didn't get 3d world 2 right like 3d world didn't change the course of that of the 2d mario quote-unquote 2d mario games but i i feel like it's going to be more impactful this this one to kirby yeah i mean i think in in defense of mario 3d world there that was the second game compared to 3d land right and then we did get bowser's fury i just think that the wii u kind of muffled the the game a little bit there that's that's fair that's fair but but yeah we will see i imagine that we'll we'll get more uh 3d world as well uh in the future but mario is just kind of in a weird place right now where we also haven't gotten a new 2d mario game at this point since 2013 when the wii u launched uh not counting mario Mario Maker. maker yeah yeah so that that's pretty crazy but we're gonna keep talking about kirby but before we do that let me tell you about our sponsors. All right, guys, let's talk about skincare. If your skincare routine is basically you washing your face in the shower with that one shower gel you've been using since high school, then it's time to level up your skincare game. But thanks to Lumen, you can drop that bottle of three in one and start using products that actually take care of your skin. All their products aim to help with those stubborn acne scars, under eye dark circles, wrinkles, sun damage, dry skin, oily skin, and more. Uh, starting with Lumen is easy. All you have to do is take their two minute quiz on their website and they'll tell you exactly what routine is best for for you based on your skincare needs. Plus, all their products are made using only natural ingredients that actually work. Guys, I swear, skincare shouldn't be that complicated thing we dread doing, and thanks to Lumen, it's simple. It takes you less than 90 seconds of your day. It's easy, and you'll have skin as smooth as Kevin Coelho's shaved cheeks. Level up your skincare game with Lumen Skin today. Go to lumenskin.com slash kindoffunny to get your free trial of Lumen's products. That's L-U-M-I-N skin.com slash kindoffunny to get your free trial of Lumen's products products. That's lumenskin.com slash kind of funny. This, of course, is one of my favorite sponsors of all time. It's Honey, ladies and gentlemen. When you're shopping online, it's easy to save money on your iPhone or computer. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. And if Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch your prices drop. Here's, ladies and gentlemen, where I go and I, boop, I hit pause on the end because I use Honey all the time. This is my Google Chrome, and right there is the Honey button. You install it there, you can use it on your iPhone too, but it's great. It saves you money, and then if you're logged into, it accrues Honey coins that you can then spend on gift cards and stuff all the time. But then yesterday, 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 I was buying some Mizzou stuff off the internet. Guess what? There it is. I don't even think about it. Honey just pops up, little dancing coin. He's like, you want me to save you some money? And I'm like, yes, you do. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. I never recommend something I don't use. So get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash kinda. That's joinhoney.com slash kinda. Every day you gotta get up, worry about work, worry about your family, worry about when you're playing games. It's too much. So remove the stress for shopping for clothes with Cuts Clothing. Cuts Clothing has perfected the art and science of men's shirts. So now you can throw on one look and look great without ever having to think about it. Plus, Cuts has all the essentials for looking sharp like tees, hoodies, polos, and more, so you can stop bouncing between brands and shopping for different shirts. Tim Gettys loves Cuts. He went online, found the blues he loved, and then had them shipped to his door so he can go get haircuts and stare at electronics knowing he looks great. Cuts has totally revolutionized the traditional outdated t-shirt category. They make it easy to mix and match styles and colors so you can find the perfect style. They even developed their own fabric that's soft as hell and guaranteed not to pillar shrink. Join hundreds of thousands of guys who have made the simple decision to elevate their wardrobe with cuts. Get 15% off your first order by going to cutsclothing.com slash kinda funny. That's C-U-T-S clothing.com slash kinda funny for 15% off the only shirt worth wearing. Could it be? Another word back. I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but the music in this game is just absolutely 
absolutely incredible. Like it is so good. It is so hype and it makes the game so much more enjoyable. Every single song in this game is a slap and a half. The main theme itself is as good as the Mario Galaxy soundtrack. And like that is like the highest compliment I can give uh, for this type of game. It's the same composer that did the original music for Melee and Smash 64. So like they know what they're doing and they make everything you're doing feel epic. And like you are making something dope happen, even when you do this little pink puff ball. And I think that that is like the coolest thing is this juxtaposition between this cute, adorable guy that you are and the adorable friends and enemies and everything and how epic it all feels. Like, I'm so surprised by that. Did you come away thinking the same thing, Tom? Yeah, it's really, the music really does elevate it. And that's kind of also just a part of Kirby in this game, right? Because like one of the, one of the, the sword evolutions makes the sword like twice the size of Kirby and gives you a giant spike shield. And then you like go fight bosses and castles. And you're like, it, it, it's very funny for this game to come out around the same time as Elden Ring because they're not similar at all. But then you're looking at this and you're like, oh, this is supposed to be the cute one. And Kirby's got a giant sword. <laughs> And, yeah, and it's just dual wielding pistols that in, is one of the abilities. Talk like, to an legit. NPC that their whole family died recently. It's like, oh, this is so sad. This is depressing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, of of these have been kidnapped. Yo, are you you talk, like some <laughs> of the plot points in this game are shockingly dark. Like yeah, yeah. It, it gets really, I really like, well, yeah. OK, I guess you're doing that. But um, going back to the, the weirdness of it all, like they just commit so hard to uh, this like weird mix of the cute things doing epic stuff in ways that reminds me a lot of uh the kingdom hearts trailers that don't have the sound effects like how weird they are where it's like, why would you ever do this but the game just decides to take that energy and be like this is what we're doing like this is why you're here and you're like i don't want that that's weird and then like an hour later, you're like, I am so in. Let's get even weirder. And I realized it eventually turns to not just the Weird Kingdom Hearts energy, but it's the energy of, remember playing Odyssey for the first time? And then you see the dinosaur and you're like, "Yeah, what the fuck? And then later there's the dragon level and you're like, mm. excuse me? This is a Mario game? Like, how does that make sense? That's this entire game. Like, every yeah. single level has some moment that's like the dragon moment in, in Mario Odyssey where you just kind of have to stop and go, what? But then after a certain amount of time, you're like, oh, that's what this game is. It's just what moment after what moment back to back and eventually it just kind of becomes part of its charm. I know this is always a fun question for the Switch, but how is it in terms of presentation like both from art style and then also fidelity like does it run good um i know like for me playing playing games on the switch for the last year specifically travis rex or not travis rex again uh no my heroes 3 was the one that kind of broke me in terms of man i just want this game to look better did you ever have <laughs> that moment playing this game not really i thought this game was really good looking and it does run well like i i know a lot of people had performance problems with the demo and i didn't notice really any performance issues while i was playing um and there's like I, I talked about this a little earlier about like the you know kind of sometimes you can like be on the same similar looking rooftop or whatever but i really did think this game was really pretty there's a whole carnival level or carnival world uh that is just so vibrant like i think that's that's what really impresses me most about it is its use of color is super super good it is very bright and very colorful uh the whole way through yeah it's interesting i'm i'm torn in a lot of directions when it comes to how to answer that question because this is this is nintendo at its best where it's art style speaking very loudly and it's awesome it is very very cool the colors are amazing they're well utilized the um worlds are uniquely identifiable where it's never just oh we're in the desert world now or oh we're just in the snow world there's always like one extra level of gimmick to that visually and aesthetically that kind of like makes it again weirder like to me weird is the the main word to use for this game like it's not just a snow land it's like a snowy london and it's like why that's weird as shit the last level was disneyland but for kirby like what like complete with like the main street electrical parade and stuff and it's like that kind of just constant it's this but that is what makes it so cool because it, it looks great. The enemy designs are fantastic. Like overall, it looks very good. Um, but it 
did have a lot of performance issues uh, for me in terms of slowdown and stuff that got distracting a lot. In some ways, it kind of had that old school classic video game charm of like you're fighting a bunch of enemies and there's the slowdown and like it kind of uses it to your advantage and like you kind of play into it. And it's not bad, but there were multiple times doing the challenges um, where I'm really trying to get my time down and shave off the seconds as much as possible. And the slowdown doesn't stop the clock from moving at real time. And that on multiple occasions fucked up my runs. And I was like, come on, Nintendo, like figure your shit out. Cause like that wouldn't happen on other systems. And like, that is kind of a bummer. And I will say the game looks absolutely stunning in handheld mode on the OLED. I cannot believe how poppy this thing is playing it on my TV. I'm like, it looks good, but it looks really good start, enough. Like you're not sitting looks- there being like, eh. Exactly. It's, I'm not like, uh, but I'm also not like, yo, this is amazing. Gotcha. I think this game looks amazing on uh, in, in handheld on the OLED. Like the colors pop and it looks like it was made for that experience. That's there, so plus, interesting. So interesting to hear you. You had performance issues because I know I heard other people talk about that with the demo and I didn't see any. So like and I was playing on a whatever the one point one model of the switch is, you know, that like weird in mm-hmm. between not an OLED where the battery was better, but it wasn't like. Right. Yeah. 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 But Andy. there's something really interesting about kind of how Nintendo chooses to develop some of their games. And I don't know whether certain engines are being utilized, uh, but like I still look at Odyssey and I think Odyssey is a five year old game at this point. Mario Odyssey and it is still one of the better looking Switch games. And I look at Kirby and it's one of the better looking Switch games. And I think a lot of that is like here's the materials that we're using and the colors are popping and the metal looks good and the water looks awesome. And then it just, I don't know why they choose to use other engines aside from functionality maybe, but like that's why I'm always like my heart breaks whenever I see a game like Mario golf come out. It's like, just Mm -hmm. use the other, Mm -hmm. like use the other aesthetics. What, what, why does this game look so bad and look worse than a five-year-old game like Mario Odyssey? And I just it's kind of a major annoyance that I have with Nintendo. Like maybe it's them not wanting things to start to look super homogenous and stuff. But it's like it looks better. Like you just use whatever you're using here. You know, some of it might be also like the art team and like the amount of, I guess, like not uh, talent is the wrong word, but maybe it it is manpower. Right. Like how many people do you have on the art team and how do how well do they know know how to work with the switch? Because like. You know, I look at Pokemon Legends Arceus as well, and that game, as soon as I booted up on my TV, I was like, ugh, I do not like how this looks. And that went from, like, the grass texture, from, like, seeing the trees, seeing the pop-ins, seeing anything in that game. I felt looked disgusting on my TV and looked way better on my OLED. But that's a game that, in other aspects, do so much more. And, like, you know, it's not it's not a bad game by any means. It just has an art style that didn't sit well with me versus Mario Odyssey, I'm right there with you. Like, I booted it up again recently, like a week ago, and I was like, yeah, this game looks hot. Like, this game looks pretty. And I still think now, especially, what, five years into the Switch, after having a PS5 and Xbox Series X, uh, I look at the fidelity on games on Switch, and now be- things become more identifiable in terms of, like, some of the 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 jagged edges I'd see on character models on in Odyssey or in Breath of the Wild, right? Even the slowdown that you'd get when you'd walk into the Lost Woods in Breath of the Wild. Like, that stuff sticks out to me a bit more but also like i think art style wise breath of the wild and odyssey and now it seems like kirby and the forgotten lands find ways to circumvent that and like really lean into how do we find the colors and the um the art direction that works for this yeah and Mansion and mario party another our other really good shout outs like those games are really party pretty right. regardless of how you, you know how you could start to see the aliasing a bit more and you could start to see those jaggies around characters like they just have a really good look to them so yeah. there's something really interesting with with Kirby and the Forgotten Land in terms of it, its style and its art, where I, I think that we're this is one of the first times I can identifiably see a push and pull between their design philosophy and the tech and what they're like trying to actually accomplish with it all visually, because it kind of has the same fuzzy vignette look that Link's Awakening had, where the edges of the screen are always slightly more blurred, like almost like a depth of field effect um, to kind of like mask the issues that the game would have otherwise. And I think that it's a choice that overall adds to the design of it all. And it kind of adds to the the poppy colors of it all. And it makes the center of the screen, like the, the, the 
sharp lines and stuff stand out even more and it i think works really well but the thing that i'm kind of bummed about is this weird thing i want everyone that plays to keep their eyes out on is anything in the distance like 30 feet or more away from your character has this really interesting um half frame rate look to it where you'll see enemies and they're moving and it almost looks stop motion and it is one of the coolest effects I have ever seen in a game, and especially with this art style where I'm like, oh, my God, if they just committed to that look and made that part of the whole experience, I think this could this could be something that's like truly special. But instead, it kind of feels like that was a um, concession that they had to make to, to make the rest of the game run well. So it, it kind of throws me off where I'm like, whoa, the the worst looking thing I think actually gives more identity to, to what we we're going with here but i think that they still play together in an interesting way where you see the stop motion thing in the distance and then by the time you get to it there's not like a jarring cut between they're not stop motion and then they are uh like it's it's kind of more seamless in a way where i'm like the people technically that made this game really understood all the limitations and they kind of worked with them in a way that is very impressive any other thoughts on it tom yeah, no, I uh, I agree. It's funny because I do think that that stop motion effect is probably a, a like a performance saving thing. It's right? Absolutely, it's, yeah. That's we've, it's we've basically an that. LOD for animation. Yeah, they they did that in the new Pokemon Pokemon Legends, right? Did that as yeah. well, but to a um, let let's call it less successful degree. Maybe <laughs> um, it was a little bit more distracting in that game. But I think also you have longer distances you're looking in that game than in in Kirby. Um, but I agree. I mean, like Kirby has always been, had this feel of like, you know, it's a little toy, right? He's a very cute little thing and it's very toy ish and feels like that. And I like that they leaned into this idea of this, these almost being like little dioramas, right. That you're playing with. Um, and yeah, I, I am overall very impressed with the art style. I don't know what goes into making a game perform well or better or worse in the visuals, right? Like it's so funny to me to look back at breath of the wild as just still such a gorgeous game and look at other open world games that have come out on switch since then and been, be like, Oh, like, wow, people really are having a tough time hitting that bar. So that yeah. must've been a hard thing to do. Right. Um, but even that game had slowdowns at points. So it's, it's, it's tricky. The switch is, unfortunately aging but i'm so happy that nintendo can continue to find ways to make games look like this and look this good on this hardware yeah and uh the last thing i want to say uh about the the gameplay itself is th it's a slow game and like it, it is not mario and when you no. when you first start playing especially the kind of like opening uh levels you're like oh damn kirby is he, he doesn't like to run like this this is Showing a, a walking age. boy for sure <laughs> a um, big old and, boy who likes to walk <laughs> <laughs> uh and the, constantly in the earlier levels i was like oh just give me an ability to like long jump or something like you can in mario or like to roll or to, to something you know and you just don't get it for a while and then eventually you start getting the abilities and like it does hit a point that you're like pretty much any time i had a, a major criticism of the game within time it was addressed uh, in terms of the mobility or in terms of the eh, combat's all right, but I wish it was a little bit deeper. And then it ends up getting even deeper than I wanted it to. So that was kind of my experience with the game overall is like coming in with very low expectations, but hoping that it was something cool and then being like, oh, you know what? This is almost cool. And then them delivering the cool thing and then one step further. So overall, yeah. I am very happy with it. it I'm it's, excited for this. This is maybe... Uh... I don't need to, to kick this dead horse or beat this dead horse necessarily. But one of the things that came up is I reviewed Balan Wonderworld back in, you know, <laughs> la a bless. year ago. Thank you for your service. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and I gave that game a four because it is a bad game. It is a bad video game, but it is so interesting. It was so interesting playing this game and like looking at all of the things that Balan Wonderworld tried to do and did terribly and then this game does so many of the same things in this a very similar structure, a very similar idea with these copy abilities that are being reused and the way levels are designed and the collectibles, but it just does them so well. It, it's really, it's really, really interesting to look at it in comparison to other similar games, because I, I, I agree with Tim. I think it is not just 
a good Kirby game. I think it is a really well designed game. And there you go. Moving on from Kirby, I want to talk just a little bit about the Mario Kart 8 booster pass. Uh, Barrett, if you can pop off the bench for a sec, I'd love to hear your thoughts as the man that's put more time into Mario Kart than anyone else I know. Uh, yeah, it was really enjoyable. We, we popped in on stream last Friday to check them out for the very first time. Um, and yeah, I, I had a fun time. I've, I've jumped into them a couple of times more since then, uh, just to get like more of a feel of like how I feel about the new tracks. And of course, I think all of them are tracks from other games that have been kind of, uh, ported over to Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. And I, it was just it was fun to jump back into that and not have everything you know memorized um, with all of the the other Mario Kart tracks and just like get like a, a another moment of like all right let me learn what this course is again and and, and all of this stuff and you know there's a lot of uh, uh, tracks from tour that were ported over in these eight uh, first tracks that we got um, now uh, people have like their own thoughts on tour but like. The, the tour tracks, which felt like, which were new to me rather than, you know, like a re-experiencing uh, Chaco Mountain from the N64 days and, and stuff like that. Like, that was really, really cool. The the one, um, I'm trying, I'm blanking on the, the name of it. Um, I think it was like Ninja Hideaway or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's the one everyone's talking about. Yeah. Like so that, cool. It, it, it's one of the coolest designed Mario Kart levels, I would say, even compared to some of the levels in Mario Kart 8 in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it was just it got me really excited to see what we'll see in the future, uh, if anything else. Like, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, be playing the these tracks like on loop for like the next couple of weeks or anything like that. But it was it was such a fun excuse to to get back, you know, earn some more three stars on on cups and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, just uh, jump into some multiplayer over the weekend. And, you know, I. There's been some talk about, like, oh, the level of fidelity isn't up to par with, like, what the original tracks from Mario Kart 8 delivered. And I personally don't care because, you know, there's the videos of people, like, stopping their race to, like, look at the details of, like, grass and sand and stuff like that. Like, it's a fucking Mario Kart <laughs> That's game. literally every racing game. Yeah, it's just, like, uh, whatever. Like, uh, I really don't care as long as the feel of it and the music uh, really, like, nails the kind of presentation of a of a track like that's all i really need and we were talking about it on stream of like the music for each track was so fun and so magical in in their own ways that you know either brings you back to the old school stuff or gets you into the 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 newer stuff with the tour track so um yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm excited to get more and more over the next, like, year and a half, uh, almost two years at this point. Um, and I'm, it's one of those things before this first pack came out, I was like, man, we're not getting as much of, like, the, the old school tracks, like, ported over here. I want more of the N60. Give me all of the N64 tracks that you can. Give me some of the, the 3DS tracks from Mario Kart 7. I don't care about these new tour tracks. But now I'm like... Oh, I'm I'm down for a mix after the, the the first eight tracks here, like, and that's not not something I expected. Even not just the the Ninja Hideaway. There's like the kind of like Paris level that kind of changes. Paris Promenade. Each, yeah, Paris Promenade was dope. With like each uh, kind of uh, um, lap lap, like changing your course and stuff like that. And there is a similar one. Um, I, I forget the names of, but yeah, I'm I'm surprised that I'm I'm just excited what, for whatever they they poured over to the to the game now and and kind of like redo for for the Mario Kart Eight engine and stuff like that just because it's it's it, it brings you back into that magical space and uh, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I don't think I have too much to add because I think I think Barrett really kind of nailed the the sentiment there. But I would really recommend everyone go check out on youtubecom slash plays the archive of the stream we did. Even just watching the first like twenty minutes of us experiencing the maps for the first time, like I think really does a good job of expressing like how cool these things actually are. Where sure the fidelity of some levels is not the same as it is in the core game, but I don't think that it's like distractingly lower, and the quality of everything else is just as high. Like the music. Um, is by the, the same team that did the music of the core game. So it it 
if you were to play some of these levels uh, in just like back to back with the older levels, I don't really think that you would notice any difference at all um, actively. And I think that that's uh, a key thing to point out because like, sure, it's not as pretty, but that's because they just took mobile game and like just up some things and added mm-hmm. some stuff. But um, I think that where the real magic lies is the fun inventiveness of through in the first 20 minutes, we had multiple moments where we were like, oh shit, we on lap two, the other um, opponents are now coming at me. So like you're on the same course and you have to dodge incoming traffic of other racers. And it's like, that's not something we see much of in Mario Kart. And then playing that Ninja Hideaway level was like an amazing moment of all of us being just blown away by the level design. And it was just a lot of us like, oh my God, you can go up. Oh my God, there's this, there's a jump over here. Like that is Mario Kart at its best. And I, it really was cool. Um, I said this during the, the stream, but like, It kind of feels like Mario Kart is an instrument and doing this felt like playing sheet music, sight reading it for the first time of like, you you know how to play uh, the the guitar, but you don't know how to play this song. But then you start Mm -hmm. to learn the song and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, I'm a rock fucking God. And that's that's so damn cool. Bless. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I agree 100 percent with the things that you guys are saying. I think the one thing I'll add, too, is that like. You know, when we talk about these levels, I think the thing that I love the most is how much they're willing to be gimmicky with these levels, right? You mentioned going this, going opposite directions on the same road. You mentioned Ninja Hideaway, which has all these different routes, right? And, like, that's the stuff I love. And I don't think anybody does, like, gimmicks better than Nintendo. And I think that really does shine through in, uh, with these new levels where, you know, one of my favorite Mario Kart levels is... Oh, I forget what it's called. It's the it's the Yoshi one though. That is like very maze like that. You know, I don't know if a lot of other people like that level, but I like that level <laughs> just out of nostalgia and out of how ridiculous that level is. And like you know, having the question marks uh, on your map till so you don't know where people are Which on the map. Like they didn't include in the Mario Kart Eight version of that track, bless, and it makes me sad. Yeah, it was so good in N sixty four. It was so good in N sixty four, and I kind of had the, that same the, the kind of the revival of that feel a little bit in Ninja Hide- Hideaway, where it doesn't like split off you know many directions but being able to take the stairs versus take the right side being able to you know float up in the sky versus like stay on the ground those are the kind of that's the kind of track design that i really dig out of mario kart so i like i i like seeing that return and i also like seeing uh i like having an opportunity to play the mario kart tour tracks because i was never going to play those tracks in any other scenario <laughs> and so like i think this is such a good idea to give these tracks some sort of ex- no pun intended extra life uh so that people are able to actually experience them if they didn't get to play mario kart tour and so i've been having a blast with it i can't wait for them to add more tracks and to close out the show andy cortez i want to hear you talk about the ghost runner dlc that you finally got to spend some time with yeah ghost runner dlc came out on march 3rd i've just been so wrapped up with elden ring that i haven't really wanted to play anything else but i decided to give it a, a go and i was initially a little bit worried about it and i told you all how it reminded me of like man i love shovel knight and uh, this game's really, really good. And then Yacht Club started coming out with other iterations on Shovel Knight, like the the King and the Scepter of Torment or whatever. And I, it's they weren't the exact same experience, and therefore I just didn't find them as magical. You know, it's like we're introducing sort of new mechanics with the same formula, and it just didn't quite work. And initially, I kind of felt that way about the Ghost Runner DLC. Uh, you play as I believe a character named Hell, H-E-L. And it's very much like Ghost Hunter. You have the sword. Uh, There's a couple new mechanics that have been added with the same sort of formula of clear out the room without dying. Uh, There's a lot of of movement. I feel like the game starts off a bit tougher in the way that Ghost Runner slowly kind of ramps up that difficulty. And this game kind of uh, throws... A lot of different elements at you. Is this is this one of those DLCs where they expect you to have like it kind of feels like they expect you have come off the campaign like you just finished and here's more so like we're gonna not give you any introduction you're just gonna be tossing the event. Uh, I mean it it definitely starts off with tutorialized things while kind of giving you story moments okay. uh, where you are running through and then it'll say space bar to jump and then you sure 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 uh, I, I you know it still does its its job right but I think it throws a bit more. I think the difficulty is there a bit quicker this time around. Um, and I was a little bit worried about these added mechanics and how they would affect my experience, but I, I'm loving it. Uh, I'm so glad I, I kind of like quickly turned that corner. It's just as fun as playing through Ghost Runner, which was one of my favorite games of 2020. Um, it's, 
it's an absolute blast to play. Um, and again, it just it's kind of what I love about games like Katana Zero and just you feel like a goddamn cool ass expert while you're clearing out this room and um, working with the, the different kit that you have. And they've added some new newer mechanics. Um, so I highly recommend it. I believe it's free. I think it's a free DLC that as long as you own Ghost Runner, you essentially have this DLC. I have to double check on that. Um, but the game's great, and I highly recommend it if you dug Ghost Runner at all. And it's another one of those games uh, I was talking to Tim about. There's a lot of people who have been asking me, like, how did you learn how to do keyboard and mouse? And I think Ghost Runner, along with games like Boomerang X, are really good, almost like keyboard mouse tutorials. Uh, they're really good exercises to get your kind of dexterity and figure out how to control while playing a game. Um, I think they they sort of ramp up what the game asks from you in a really sort of smart way. So um, I highly recommend it. Go check out the DLC. Um, and I'm double checking to see if it's free or not. <laughs> <laughs> was it, well, yeah, you, you enjoyed that... it and everything else. Was it, did it, were you playing it though? Going, Man, I wish I was playing Elden Ring. No, Good. no. And, and that's, that's, I think, a, a really good mark of, like, a, a game that I'm enjoying where, like, I haven't even beat it yet, but it reminds me of Tunic, where I played through Tunic, and I was like, ah, I gotta fucking play this game. Like, a game I've been looking forward to. I just want to be playing Elder Ring. And quickly, you get kind of, uh, you get just into the systems, and you start to want to get better at it. Um, so, yeah, I, I have a lot of fun with it. I'm still not done with it, and I plan on beating it. But, yeah, it's a lot of fun. So if you are into Ghost Runner, highly recommend it. Well, there you go. This has been the Kind of Funny Games cast. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, make sure you go check out the Kirby and the Forgotten Land review over on IGN.com, written by Tom himself. But Tom, where can people find you in particular? Uh, you can follow me on at Tom R. Marks on Twitter, and that's basically it. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> Reginald Marks. Yes. No. 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 Randy. But what is somebody, it? Somebody has Regina guessed marks. it. Someone has guessed it. Damn. Yeah, yeah, it already happened. Somebody has this been it? going on for you for this long? Because like there, I there still know, I've known Tom for years and I still don't know his middle name. I was listening You'll to Beyond know. in 2020 and this is what happening. Yeah, there it was a bit on Beyond for like two or three years, and then somebody guessed it on NVC. <laughs> that's oh, wow. that's a very uh, beyond NVC story right yeah. there. Yeah. And by the way, Ghost Runner is fifteen dollars, one five dollars. There we oh, go. That's not free, everybody. There also, play the Returnal DLC. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about this somewhere else. But we're about to do the post show exclusively for patreon.com slash game supporters. It is another thrilling episode of Bless Who. Until next time, I love you all. Bye. <laughs>